Hi, today we had in Odysseus a joint workshop with Inherit, another project that does research in ORM explosive precursors. Um, and this workshop has the opportunity to talk about um, the regulation of chemicals in Europe and um, in particular about the explosives precursors. So um, the presentation was mainly about the REACH regulation, CLP regulation and the explosives precursors regulation. The REACH regulation has about 850 pages. It's a huge um, regulation uh, with a lot of content, um, but its subject or objectives are the protection of human health and the environment and uh, also the free circulation of substances on the internal market. Um, the uh, competent agency is the European Chemicals Agency uh, based in, in Helsinki in Finland and the REACH system consists of the registration, evaluation, authorization and restriction of chemicals which means that any chemical substance that is manufactured or imported into the EU has to be registered um, uh, but there are of course exemptions and then I covered um, the definitions of certain actors and also um, about some of the um, various types of, of chemicals in this regulation. Uh, then I, I talked about this risk-based um, approach of the REACH system, as I said before, with the registration and then the evaluation. So um, the agency uh, evaluates and performs a compliance check of the registrations about the information that was provided within the uh, registration about the technical dossiers that are submitted by or with the registration and also they perform uh, evaluations of the substances themselves uh, throughout the years uh, although the agency does uh, the coordination uh, in for the substance evaluation and the um, competent authorities from the member states actually perform the evaluation of the substances. Um, then we talked about um, the authorization of substances that, uh, substances that, have, um, that are of very high concern, uh, the SVHC, uh, as you can see the abbreviation on the slide. Uh, this is about um, substances with such a risk that needs to be controlled by authorization and in the end um, if those with an unacceptable risk to human health and environment um, these are restricted substances that are only allowed to be used in the EU um, when in compliance with the restrictions. Then there, I showed an example uh, about the restrictions uh, the conditions of such a restriction uh, uh, in regards to ammonium sulfide so these substances are listed in annex 17 and uh, this would be an example of how uh, what conditions have to be met uh, to use ammonium sulfide in this uh, particular case when they produce um, like uh, chokes and hoaxes um, when with uh, clothing, sneezing powder, or stink bombs. Uh, the registration itself, then uh, I, I emphasized the slogan uh, or the title of Article 5, no data, no market. So again, any manufacturer or importer uh, of a substance has to register the substances uh, if they uh, produce in quantities of one ton or more per year. Uh, the same applies to articles and uh, isolated intermediates. And then I showed some statistics published by the agency and uh, addressed the exemptions, of course, product and process oriented research and development exemptions. Although already the recital refers to that that um, 
research normally does not uh, depend on substances of more than one ton, although this is still um, an explicit exemption to regulation. Then there are substances listed in Annex 4, um, like sugars, as you can see, helium, nitrogen. Nitrogen is um, insofar interesting because it's a, a common um, substance of explosives, but it causes minimum harm because it's a very stable um, substance and yet um, it, it's used in, in many um, explosives and this shows already how difficult it is to um, regulate chemicals. And uh, there are also in Annex 5 other substances uh, described uh, that are not necessary to registration as there is already enough information and um, in the yeah the, then I covered what has to be included in the uh, what information has to be included at the registration and uh, when it's about the registration of substances produced in quantities of one ton or imported more than one ton or more per year then there is the necessity to conduct a chemical safety t assessment and this has to be documented uh, with a chemical safety report. So this has also been a uh, part of the registration. And as we can see, the, the more uh, substances are imported or manufactured in the EU, the more information the agency gathers. Um, but in regards to substances that are produced in low quantities, they don't have to be registered and we don't have much information and knowledge about them. Uh, within the supply chain, I, I address the safety data sheets where suppliers and recipients um, or supplier have to provide recipients uh, with data sheets. And uh, these, when, when substances are classified as hazardous or are persistent, bioaccumulative and toxic. And uh, then I showed what the, the contents, what should be all included in such a data sheet. Um, as you can see here, this is now a part of the basic physical and chemical properties. So this is one part of, of one section of the data sheet. And uh, here you can find information of a substance about its color, odor, flammability, also alt ignition temperature and stuff like that. And there's then the physical hazard class of explosives to the left on the right side, you see uh, all the other categories of physical hazard classes. And again, within the uh, class of explosives, you will find information about the sensitivity to shock, effect of heating on the confinement, effect of ignition on the confinement, sensitive sensitivity of uh, to impact, to friction, thermal stability, and so on. And then I went over to the CLP regulation, focusing on the classification, rather not on the labeling packaging, which is, which is um, um, a requirement for suppliers, but the classification uh, has to be done by um, any actor within the supply chain. And it uh, complements, uh, this regulation complements the REACH regulation. And then I again showed some definitions and uh, the hazard pictograms, they are quite common. Uh, also, you see some of them in the supermarkets when you buy articles there. And the class of explosives compromises, of course, ex substances and mixtures, explosive substances and so on. Then I showed how the, based on the UN recommendations on the transport of dangerous goods and manual of tests and criteria, um, substances are categorized into unstable explosive or in the explosives divisions. Um, so I showed what's um, in the regulation. There are, these are the procedures, how to classify the substances. This is the procedure to when it's about the unstable explosive to decide is it an 
explosive or an unstable explosive or is it for now temporarily accepted as a unstable explosive and it will be further divided uh, into the other um, subcategories if you will um, like division 1.1 uh, up to division 1.5, 1.6 uh, addresses only articles. So the higher the number, the less uh, hazardous the substance is. Um, there's a particular process about um, the ammonium nitrate, which is um, the, I mean, for the ammonium nitrate emulsions, suspensions, or gels. So uh, in regards to such substances, then this has to be uh, processed by this test series. Uh, either it's an unstable explosive or it falls under uh, the, any of these divisions. Um, and then I covered the explosive precursors regulation, which is in focus of both projects because precursors, explosives precursors being everyday products that can be bought in any shop but be misused for the illicit manufacture of explosives and there are some substances that are regulated and restricted for the general public and um, again I went through some definitions like economic operators who um, you sell in the end sell such precursors and the only marketplace where the econo uh, the only marketplace being an intermediary intermediary between economic operators and the users and professional users are those who can demonstrate uh, a need uh, for such substances or precursors for their trade business or profession and everyone who's not a professional user is a member of the general public and um, this regulation relies a, uh, a lot uh, on suspicious transactions and economic operators have to uh, detect such suspicious transaction. Um, then I showed the difference of regulated explosive precursors and restricted explosive precursors. Uh, um, as you can see that Annex 1 includes the restricted uh, is narrower, but is also a regulated explosive precursor. Why? Because um, both uh, or all regulated explosive precursors have to be reported um, when there um, has been noticed uh, um, a substance, uh, a significant disappearance of such substances or theft, then this has to be reported by the uh, user economic operator uh, whoever had, is in possession or was in possession of such such substances then they have to report this within 24 hours to the competent authority and here you see in annex 2 the uh, substances that are regulated so uh, the um, for example if there's acetone missing to a significant amount in in the storage when the shop owner comes to the storage and sees uh, a lot of nail polishers and, or nail vanisher is, is missing, then this needs to be reported because of the acetone. And in Annex 1, I addressed the restricted precursors. So they are only allowed to be used, and use means everything from possession, storage, uh, acquisition, uh, to a certain amount. You can see like nitric acid only to three percent weight by weight and uh, when the a member state allows a licensing for members of the general public they are allowed to buy such sub precursors only or products containing such um, explosive precursors only to the upper limit uh, that you see in the uh, far right column in the third column uh, but only if they have a license and uh, an overview of the EU member states shows that most of them prohibit uh, the acquisition of such um, precursors to the amounts uh, allowed as you can see in Annex 1 so, and others are not permitted 
for what uh, in any way so there's no chance for uh, members of the public to um, use such explosive precursors to amount more than the limit value in column two so in Austria for example and Sweden there it's possible to acquire um, these three uh, uh, these four <laughs> these four are it's possible to acquire uh, because there's a license regime in place and there's also the safeguard clause as you can see in Denmark the safeguard clause is also an option allowed by the regulation allowing member states to include substances to further restrictions uh, that are not uh, included in Annex 1 or Annex 2. And uh, so it is all up to the econo econ economic operators uh, to, to, um, to make sure that their personnel is aware uh, what products contain regulated explosive precursors and that they are instructed on the obligation of this regulation so they need to have appropriate reasonable and proportionate procedures and um, yeah uh, and at, at have to verify upon sale of a prospective customer their identity the license the trade or business or profession the company name so if it's i mean if it's a professional user then they have to uh, verify the trade business profession if they can do so um, otherwise um, also the company name address and the registration number and they have to inquire about the intended use of the restricted explosive precursors we come to that later and they have also to keep the information of each per purchase for it at least 18 months and they have to report the significant disappearances I mentioned already before. The same uh, obligations apply to online marketplaces with the only addition that they have to ensure that also their users, meaning economic operators, um, comply with the rules. And when do they have to report a suspicious transaction? this when they um, um, suspect the prospective customer um, to to uh, yeah to to buy um, explosive precursors for um, for reasons for illicit reasons when they for example um, are unclear about the intended use when they're unfamiliar un unfamiliar with the intended use of these uh, explosive precursors and cannot explain it um, if they buy it in quantities combinations or concentrations uncommon for legitimate use or, or if they're unwilling to provide proof of identity or if they insist on unusual methods of paying like a large, like using large amounts of cash these are criteria to be considered by economic operators and online marketplaces to detect suspicious transactions if they do so then they shall refuse the suspicious transaction report it and if possible they should report the identity of the customer and then they should report all the details which have led them to consider the transaction to be suspicious including all the factors and criteria mentioned from the slide uh, before and they should report this to the national contact point meaning the um, competent um, authority At the end, I showed them um, an example of a fact sheet that was created by another project. And this is um, a, a, like a template to be used that can be used by economic operators to uh, raise awareness uh, that they have an, uh, quite an impact on, on the on the safety uh, when it comes to explosives or homemade explosives uh, HMEs 
as they um, like you can see here summarized they when they sell products like uh, nail polish remover as I mentioned before with acetone then uh, they have to be aware that also the cashier when someone enters the shop and takes all the nail polish removers from the shelf and wants to buy them then they should be suspicious and if they tell them oh, I buy this for a prank uh, a student prank for example uh, might be legitimate but they still um, needs uh, they should be cautious about this and probably report it uh, because this is an unusual uh, am amount an unusual uh, acquisition of such products yeah and then I uh, ended with a Q&A and that was the, the, my part of this joint workshop from today. If you're interested in more, you can contact us um, and maybe we have some more opportunities to talk about the regulation of chemicals in the EU. Thank you for watching.